In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the integration between Cisco's Umbrella Secure Internet Gateway and Secure Web Gateway with a Meraki MX. So the way that this works on the back end is that using the Umbrella Secure Internet Gateway, we'll be able to establish an IPsec tunnel from our MX, which might be located at a remote branch site, directly out to Cisco's Umbrella Cloud, where then we can apply both web filtering and firewall policies to secure the traffic going to the internet. So to begin this process, we'll start on the Cisco umbrella side where we'll need to create new IPsec tunnel keys, which we'll use to configure our Meraki MX. So within the umbrella dashboard, first we're gonna go over to deployments and then down to network tunnels. Right now I don't have anything new created, so we'll go ahead and click add. We'll name our tunnel, in which case I'll name mine MX64 and we'll select our device type. Now there's going to be a handful of device types listed in here, for all sorts of connections that we could establish to Cisco Umbrella. But for the purposes of this case, we'll just select Meraki MX. Then we'll click Save. And so we'll be prompted to set our tunnel ID and passphrase. Now passphrase is pretty self-explanatory. That's going to be the pre-shared key that we'll be using for IPsec tunnel to authenticate our endpoint. Tunnel ID, however, is going to be what we'll be sending as our local identifier out to Umbrella when we connect via our IPsec tunnel. So for tunnel ID, I'll go ahead and name this home MX64. And for passphrase, I'll use a randomly generated string that I've created on the side. And once we're happy with that, we'll go ahead and click save. Now to help us configure the Meraki MX side, we'll be prompted with our tunnel ID and passphrase, along with buttons that we can easily click to copy those identifiers. Once we got those, let's go ahead and hop over to our Meraki dashboard where we'll start configuring our IPsec tunnel. Within the Meraki dashboard, we'll need to select the network that contains the MX that we want to configure. In my case, I only have one MX to test with, so I'm already set up on that network. So next, we'll jump down to Secure DNS DWAN, and under Configure, we'll look for Site to Site VPN, and we'll enter there. I don't have any other current VPNs configured. So to start with, we'll select Hub, or Mesh, and this will open up a whole bunch of options for us to configure. Don't worry about where it says there are no exit hubs to configure. Since we don't have any other Meraki MX devices in this network, there's no auto tunnel to configure. Instead, we'll configure a non-Meraki IPsec peer below. So the first thing that we will have to configure is which network do we want to route over the VPN. You'll notice by default that all of these show as VPN off. That means that if we leave this as it is, once we establish our VPN, there will be no client traffic that's going to be forced across that VPN connection. In my case, for testing, I'm going to go ahead and forward guest networking traffic over the VPN to be filtered by Cisco Umbrella. So we'll go ahead and click that and select VPN on. Now we'll scroll down just a little bit. And the next thing that we'll need to configure is under the section for non-Meraki VPN peers. We'll click add a peer. First, we'll enter a name for it. This is only locally significant for us to know what the tunnel is used for. So I'll just put in umbrella sig. Next, we're going to change our Ike version to Ike version 2. We will have to change our IPsec policy from the default. So we'll click this and this will bring up a menu. Now the good thing for us is there is a preset already for Cisco umbrella. Now the one thing that I've noticed in the current documentation is that while all of this is correct, the current Umbrella documentation does ask you to use DH group 14 instead of 5, so we'll go ahead and update this here, and then hit update. Next, we need to put in a public IP, which we don't have yet, and we'll come back to in just a second. Moving on, for local ID, this is where we're going to put in our tunnel ID that we got from Umbrella. So we'll paste that in here. We'll leave our remote ID blank. For private subnets, this is going to be the destination IP address for all traffic that should be forced across the VPN. A minute ago, we selected the guest network, which is going to be what sources will be pushed over the VPN, but for this, we need to select what destinations. Since this is intended to be an internet gateway, we'll go ahead and put 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 to route all internet traffic across this VPN. Next, we'll put in our pre-shared secret, which we can also grab from the umbrella dashboard. And now for availability, you'll notice that it says all networks. Since non-Meraki VPN peers are set up to be organization-wide, they would apply to several other networks within your Meraki dashboard if you had more than one. In my case, since I only have one network that contains one MX, I'll just go ahead and keep all networks to make it easy. Okay, so now back to the public IP field. 
This is going to be the destination pier for our IPsec tunnel. We don't know that immediately, so let's go back over to the umbrella dashboard real quick. We'll go ahead and hit done now that we've copied both our tunnel ID and passphrase. And we can see below that right now we do have our tunnel created, but it says that the status is unestablished, which is what we'd expect for now. Now in order to get our IPsec peer address, we'll go ahead and click this for more information, see network tunnel configuration. That'll open up a help page. We can scroll down just a little bit and we can see this list of Cisco umbrella data centers. We'll go ahead and click that link. And this is going to take us to a list of all of the regional data centers that we can connect to. What you'll want to do here is pick whichever data center is geographically closest to you for the best latency and response time. For me, I'll go ahead and copy the IP address for New York. And we'll go back over to the Meraki dashboard, enter that in our public IP space. And now we've finished configuring our remote non-Meraki VPN peer. The other thing to note while we're still here is that we could configure whether or not we want firewall logging. We'll go ahead and keep that on enabled. We can also establish a site-to-site -site outbound firewall. This could permit or deny traffic from traversing over the IPsec tunnel coming from our network going out to Umbrella. For now, I'll just leave that at the default permit any. Next, we'll click save changes at the bottom to go ahead and push this IPsec configuration out to our MX. You might get this warning just saying that the remote destination, which is all zeros, does in fact overlap with our internal subnets. This is going to be expected, so we'll go ahead and hit confirm changes. All right, now our changes have been saved. Okay, so I've noticed in testing that usually the umbrella dashboard is the easiest one to tell whether or not our tunnel came up online. So let's jump over to the umbrella dashboard again, and we'll go ahead and just refresh this page. And sure enough, we can see that our Meraki MX now shows us active. It's connected to the New York data center, and we can see which uh, public IP we're connecting from. We can also validate this on the Meraki side. Let's go back to the Meraki dashboard. We can go back over to security and SD-WAN, and under monitor, we'll click VPN status. Next, we'll jump over to the tab for non-Meraki peers. And sure enough, we do see our little green status light showing that our VPN is connected successfully. Now, if we had any issues connecting to the VPN, one thing that we could do is go over to network wide, down to event log, and check for VPN events here. Now, in the first four or five events that are shown here, we can see that our IPsec tunnel went ahead and connected out to our remote peer and successfully negotiated a session. Now, with that all being good, we can go ahead and test client access. Now for me, the PC that I'm using right now is actually connected to my guest network. And the fact that I'm still able to access the Meraki dashboard and the umbrella dashboard means that I still have internet access. That's a good sign. So another method that we could use to validate that we are in fact going through Cisco umbrella to get out to the internet is asking a public website for what our external IP address is. So let's go ahead and hop over to Google and ask what's my IP. We're getting a 146 dot address which is in the same subnet as the umbrella data center list that we were looked at earlier. So by this point, we should be pretty confident that we are in fact going through Cisco umbrella to get out to the internet. Now that we have all of this configured and our tunnel is online, let's go ahead and apply some firewalling and web security policies to start securing our guest network. So we'll go back over to the umbrella dashboard. Under policies, we'll go under firewall policy. And right now, the only thing that we see is the default rule, which is gonna be a permit any on this firewall policy page, we'll be able to create a firewall rule set similar to what you would create on a Meraki MX or a traditional Cisco firewall. We can permit or deny traffic based on application, ports, protocols, source IPs, destination IP, and all that fun stuff. So to test this out, let's go ahead and add a new rule. And we'll name this rule test block. And we'll go ahead and keep priority as last rule before the default. We'll scroll down a little bit. And we have a whole bunch of options that we can configure here. We'll go ahead and change protocol to ICMP. One unique option you might see here is source tunnels. If we had multiple different MXs or other devices connecting out to Cisco umbrella, we could go ahead and click specific tunnel and select our MX to only apply this rule set to traffic coming over that source tunnel. We'll go ahead and leave that since this is the only one that we have configured for now. Next, we'll go ahead and drop down under destination IPs and we'll hit specific IP address. And let's go ahead and block traffic to 8.8.8.8 .8 and hit add. And we'll leave our rule schedule as on all the time. Does not expire. 
and we want to block traffic. We want logging enabled. And before we hit save, let's go ahead and test this on our machine. So if I open up a command prompt and try to ping 8.8.8.8, .8 looks like we can successfully reach it for now. Let's go ahead and save our rule. And now we see that we have our default allow rule as well as a block rule that should be stopping any ICMP traffic to 8.8.8.8. .8. So we'll jump back over to our command prompt, run that test again. Sure enough, it didn't take very long for that rule to take effect. And now we are dropping traffic to 8.8.8.8. .8 of course, if we tested, let's say 8.8.4.4, .4, we are still able to get to that. So we know that we solve internet access through Cisco Umbrella. Now, obviously, we have a lot of potential for what could be configured through just a firewall policy. But one of the other good things about using Cisco Umbrella for its secure internet gateway functionality is the ability to apply direct inline web policies without any configuration on the client PC. Any traffic that's being tunneled out to Umbrella could have a web policy applied, so that web traffic is going to get inspected as it flows through the tunnel. To give this a shot, let's go ahead and go over to web policies. And you'll see right now, I just have a default web policy created. So we'll go ahead and expand that. Now, if you have multiple identities, one thing you might want to make sure of is that this spot right here where it says apply to all identities, you want to make sure that that does include the network tunnels that are coming out to Cisco Umbrella. Now, we have a handful of settings within the web policy that we can change. But for now, just to give this a shot, I'm going to go ahead and change the destination block lists to deny a URL. So right now, we'll go to destination list. We'll hit enable, and I already have one block list created called block Cisco, which will do pretty much what you expect. It'll block any traffic going to Cisco.com. And so again, before we apply this, let's go ahead and grab another browser and we'll go to Cisco.com. And it looks like right now that page is loading. And so we'll go ahead and jump back over to our web security policy. We'll hit set and return. And now we see that we do have one destination list that's being enforced with a block list on it. So now let's go back to our web page and we'll go ahead and refresh this. Okay, and once we refresh cisco.com, sure enough, we get our umbrella block page, which is what we'd expect. This site is now blocked due to content filtering. Now, if we go back over to the Cisco umbrella dashboard, the other thing that we can look at real quick is the activity log. And we'll do that by going over to reporting and activity search. All right. And within the activity log, sure enough, we can see that we have a bunch of requests that are being funneled in through our MX64 IPsec tunnel. And I'm not going to run through all of these, but we can see right at the top. One of the most recent things that does show up in our logs is that ping test earlier to 8.8.8.8, .8 which in fact, we can see our action was blocked, which is what we had expected. We can also go back up to policies firewall policy, and we can see that our block test earlier with the firewall does now show a hit count of one for the past day. And we can also see that it was last hit today at 425 PM, which is also kind of helpful. Now within the Cisco umbrella, secure internet gateway and secure web gateway, there's a handful of ways to connect out here, including any connect proxy chaining pack files and the IPsec tunnel that we use today. This is only one way that you could implement this into your network. But I wanted to run through just a quick demo of how to do so and how to implement some basic policies. So that's going to be it for this video. I hope that this was helpful and thank you for watching.